What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Yogi Show podcast. My name is Pedro Luna. I'm here alongside my co-host, Yogi Brian. We are so excited to bring you this conversation today with the one and only Sean Korn. Before we hop into this episode, we wanted to give a quick shout out to our two brand new sponsors of the show. Check it out, fam. First and foremost, wanted to give a shout out to Moxie Malas for sponsoring the show. Moxie Malas is really a wearable affirmation of the energy within, created with genuine stones and crystals and handmade in Minnesota, where this time of year, it's like a polar vortex. So each piece represents a part of your journey. You should check it out. The mala beads are amazing. They can all be used as essential oil diffusers as well. They have a Moxie Mala Club of the Month. Check out their site, moxiemalas.com, which is M-O-X-I-E, malas.com, and use code YOGISHOW15, all one word, YOGISHOW15, for 15% off your purchase. Our second sponsor of the show today is Clever Yoga. Absolutely love Clever Yoga. I have been using their products for over two years now. You've seen them on the Yogi Memes giveaways. You've heard about them maybe before. Amazing products crafted here in the USA, made for yogis by yogis. I absolutely love the Liquid Balance Mandala Mat. It's absolutely stunningly beautiful. They have yoga wheels, products, all the props you can imagine. And you can use code YOGISHOW20 for 20% off your purchase from Clever Yoga at cleveryoga.com. Again, that's cleveryoga.com, code YOGISHOW20, all one word, to get 20% off your purchase of their amazing products. So shout out to both those sponsors for sponsoring the show. Let's hop into this episode with Sean Korn, who is an internationally acclaimed yoga teacher and public speaker known for her social activism, impassioned style of teaching, and raw, honest, and inspired self-expression. She's been teaching yoga for over 25 years, public speaking, and just had her book tour come to an end for a revolution of the soul. She's an amazing spirit. She became a grandmother the day before we recorded this show. And we are so grateful that we're able to have this time with her. Aspiring and new yoga teachers and students, this episode is going to speak right to you. So stay tuned to the end. Check it out. And please, please, please stay receptive, my friends. We appreciate you and we will see you on the other side. Boom, here we go with Sean Korn on the Yogi Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here, Sean Korn. I don't know if anyone's introduced you as grandmother Sean Korn, but we're going to introduce no. you today as Grandma Sean Korn. Congratulations and welcome to the Thank show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's the first time I'm getting that official title Yes. on a, on a, public, uh, on a public scale, so I appreciate it. But yeah, I am a grandma. Yeah, congratulations. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. What an amazing, uh, what an amazing feat uh, to be. Uh, I, can't, I don't know what that's like yet, but I know being a parent of three <laughs> children and like what that's like uh so you know i, I see uh, i see it in the future i talk about that all the time with my daughter like one day you're gonna be the one doing all this work stuff and i'm gonna hang out with you and they're like hey i'm i'm leaving now <laughs> yeah <laughs> so. well i look forward to that part of it right now i feel like my role has been relegated to a lot of laundry yeah. I've been cleaning a lot of <laughs> shit-filled laundry. <laughs> <laughs> from everyone, not just the baby, but from yeah. everyone. <laughs> so, but you know what? And not just like, I, I was, I had to wash like the bloody laundry from the birth and then the shit laundry from the, the, the baby. And I couldn't be happier. It's That's like, right. I never saw so much blood and felt so much joy because the blood was not from suffering. It's from life. And it oh, was just that. such a, truly, I felt like it was an honor to be able to like, you know, my, my mother was like, why did you wash those towels, throw them out and buy them new ones for God's sakes. And it just never occurred to me. It felt so beautiful to like, ho- just to hold all this, knowing that that blood Mm. became life and so that that's my job right now i love it I love what, a, what, an, what an amazing what that's just that's inspiring and so amazing so you're like you're doing all the things you know <laughs> what's up brian in arizona how are you today man how's it going pedro and sean thank you so much for coming on and yeah congratulations i being a grandma that's awesome saw the instagram pictures and how yeah. cool how cool that's it. Thank you. And we, we uh, just for the context for the listeners, before we hopped on the recording, like literally we had this scheduled for like a month and a half and I saw the picture on Instagram that she had the baby and I was like, well, 
I don't think that's going to happen. And we, we weren't sure. And then literally about 15 minutes ago, we got the email like, Hey, we're, we're still a go. Right. And we're like, Oh shit, we're still a go. Like, yeah, we'll yeah. Be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, right now the baby's sleeping. So this is, yeah. it's all, all this- is good. Perfect timing. Mm-hmm. The timing of the universe is perfect. So, yeah. And here we are. So thanks so much. You know, we had reached out to you. Obviously, you're like, you've been in the yoga mix for so long. We've talked to a bunch of people that have mentored underneath you and that um, you know, we've talk- interviewed Brian Kess. We had Catherine on the show and, uh, and Donnie Starkins. And, and when we talked to Donnie, Don- Donnie's an amazing human. Um, he lives in the Phoenix area. So Brian has connected with him and then we jammed with him on the show. And he was talking about this message. And I really wanted to kick the show off with that about the how dare I not. And I've heard you say it a few times in other contexts. But when he shared it with me, something really struck a chord to me like, holy shit, like, if I have a gift and I have something to share, like, how dare I not do that with the world? And I'm not I'm doing the world a disservice if I'm not doing that. Yeah. Um, can you tell us how that came into your vibration? Like that saying, like, it was this something that came to you that you were working through that all of a sudden you're like, I have to do this? Or how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, I would say that as a young yoga teacher, from the very beginning, I talked myself out, I would try to talk myself out of everything. Um, I would try to find excuses like why I wasn't ready to teach why I wasn't ready to take a teacher's training, why I wasn't ready to sub my first class, why I wasn't ready to public speak. It was just one thing after another that I would get into a panic and all this insecurity would come up and I would try to talk myself out of these opportunities. And from the very beginning, that was a little voice that would come into my head was at first it wasn't how dare you not. It was more logical. It was more if you turn down this opportunity because of your insecurity and your fear, you will that the door will shut and it will. This is as far as you will ever go creatively, professionally, um, and and then I would think, am I really going to let my insecurity keep me from sharing a gift or a message with the world? What's the worst thing that's going to happen? You know, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fuck up. I'm going to em- really. It was down to embarrassment. I was going to embarrass myself. I was going to humiliate myself. And that's when that little mantra would come to me. Like, how dare you? It would be, how dare you let that, those fears and your low self-esteem keep you from being in service to the world? And then it just got shortened to any time that would come up really quickly. It'd be like, well, how dare you not? How dare you not? And that's kind of the evolution of that. And it would force me to take risks, to put myself out there, um, to confront those limiting beliefs, to remind myself, again, the worst thing that's going to happen is that I'm going to be embarrassed, but it's not going to kill me. Mm. And that embarrassment can only lead to growth. And, And then as I became a little bit more experienced as a teacher, that philosophy expanded even further into social justice and service, recognizing the privileges that I have, the access to resources that I have, um, where I stand in the community in terms of my platform, my authority. How dare I not be in service and use these gifts and this platform in a way that is in service to God and to others? And so that's definitely a mantra that I sit with more often than not is just how dare you not. I love that message. That spoke to me so, so hard when he shared it and even more now, just like, like literally in the heart, like tugging all the strings. Yeah, it really, it really, uh, yeah. It's just, especially like new yoga teachers or new out there. It's like, that really helps like finding your voice. You know, you always hear that like a new yoga teacher is like, Oh, they found their voice. And it's like, yeah, once you get past like the ego and just like, really, how can I affect the student or the audience out there? How can I really help them out and get out of myself? Like just really powerful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, you know, I, I, I love this conversation around uh, new yoga teachers and it's something that I share in my TTs often because I think it needs to be stated. When people look at me in my career, especially if they don't know me when I was a younger teacher, I've been at this, you know, 30 years almost. And, but I think what people think about me as a teacher is my ability to communicate, that I walk into a room, I can just download all this information, that I'm really confident in my messaging. And what I tell young teachers is that what they see in me, it is skill, 
not talent, meaning that I was not born with this capacity to hold space, quite the opposite. When I did my first teacher's training, which would be back in 1994, um, I didn't do it because I wanted to become a teacher. My teacher at the time, Mati Azrati, said, the, and by the way, this is the biggest lie ever. She said to me, <laughs> don't worry about becoming a yoga teacher. Just do it for your own growth as a student. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a lie. Uh, and, and I thought like, oh, okay, I'll do it for my own growth as a student. But when I got into the teacher's training, my teacher didn't care. It was Eric Schiffman that I wasn't there to become a yoga teacher. Like everyone else, I had to teach. I had to get up in the front of the room. And what they didn't know about me, you know, everyone, Brian Kess, they all would say to me, you're going to be an amazing teacher. And I would think to myself, why? The only evidence that anyone had of that was that I was strong and flexible, that I had a, a really lovely yoga, physical yoga practice. But that was the only evidence. And flexibility and strength is not what makes a great yoga teacher. Right. It's actually the ability to be able to communicate information. And what people don't know about me is that I struggled with, uh, and I still struggle with vertigo. I get very dizzy um, in certain environments. But one of the things that used to make me very dizzy is when I would have to talk to groups of people, more than about five to eight. Once it got past that, um, I would lose my train of thought. Everything would kind of go black in the periphery. I'd start to get dizzy. And I became very self-conscious because once you lose your train of thought, then you just kind of sound stupid. And so this was a big insecurity for me. There was no way I could teach in front of people because I had this challenge with dizziness. And so I managed to make it through my entire 200-hour teacher's training without actually teaching a yoga, any, not a single pose. I didn't break up any <laughs> dyads. I made myself invisible. I was so wow. anxious about having to get up, especially because everyone was telling me I was going to be a great yoga teacher. And then, and I, I feel like I kind of a, a blackout with this because somehow after my first teacher's training, I ended up in an, an Iyengar training with Lisa Walford. And I may, managed to make it through that entire training without actually teaching a single pose. And until my final exam, there was only 12 of us in the room and I was up all night long freaking out knowing that I was going to have to teach. Um, and it was going to be the first time I was teaching. And I remember praying to God, praying for any pose except Parzo Kanasana, extended side angle. Yeah. And at that time, the mats are all set up parallel to the front of the room. And all you had to do, they were, the teacher was going to pick you. You had to go to the front of the room and then mirror the pose, uh, meaning that you speak the pose, but your body does the opposite. Yeah. It's really hard. Challenging. I never practiced it. Challenging. Yes. <laughs> Especially when you've never done it before. And so I'm standing on my mat in Tadasana, praying to God, please don't let it be um, uh, Parsvakanasana. Please, God, anything but Parsvakanasana. Of course, Lisa <laughs> says, you know, Sean, will you te par teach Parsvakanasana? So I remember crossing the front of the room and being like, fuck, fuck. <laughs> and so I get on my mat, I'm mirroring the room. I smile at everyone. I say, take a deep breath. Um, then I say, spread your legs uh, five and a half feet apart. Turn your right foot out as I turn my left foot out. Take another deep breath. Um, bend your right knee as I bend my left knee. Take another deep breath. And then as I'm leaning forward to put my hand on the floor, everything that I was afraid would happen began to happen. <sighs> It, everything goes black around the periphery. Mm -hmm. I have no words in my head. I don't know what to do. I'm looking at my hand. I'm looking at the floor. I know something has to happen that's going to bring those two pieces together, but I don't know how to say it. So I get back up and I just make a joke about it. And I say, can I try it again? Lisa's like, sure, go ahead. So same thing, spread your legs apart, turn your right foot out. As I turn my left, take another deep breath in, exhale, bend your right knee, take another deep breath in. Same thing happens. I blank. And I could see my friends out in front of me. They're like pointing to their hand and like putting it on the floor. Yep. And I'm so humiliated because I know now everyone knows is that I'm not going to be able to teach. 
that I don't have this thing that everyone said I was going to have just because I'm flexible. And so I got up out of the pose and I went to say something and my voice cracked. And Lisa Walford looks up at me. She was sitting right next to me. She said, oh, Sean, you're nervous. And I felt like all the tears come <sighs> because I realized in that moment that I really wanted to be a teacher, that yo teaching yoga meant or sharing yoga meant everything to me. And I wasn't, I had never really allowed myself to believe that I could do it. And in that moment, it affirmed that I wouldn't. But the next thing changed my life. I looked at Lisa and I said, Lisa, can I try something different? And I remember her looking up at me and just kind of like shrugging her shoulders like, sure. And I stepped off the mat and I entered into the space. And the moment the eyes were off of me personally, and I was able to feel the energy of the room, all the information that I had been studying, all of a sudden it just started to come to me. And I remember opening up my mouth, spread your legs, turn your right foot out, take a deep breath in, bend your right knee, take another deep breath in, put your hand on the floor. And it all started to flow. And in that moment, I knew, I didn't know I was going to be a good teacher, but I knew I could do this. I just had to do it differently. And it meant I needed to facilitate the experience. I couldn't be separate from it. I had to be in it, fully embodied. Then it was an exchange. And that was really like the beginning for me of training. I took five 200-hour 200 te 200 teachers training back to back. Because wow. the first one, I remembered nothing. The <laughs> second one, I retained maybe 25%. And by the time I took my fifth one, I'm like, yeah, I think I got this. <laughs> I think I'm good to go now. <laughs> yes. Fifth time's a charm. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, I often like to share that, te that, that story with young yoga teachers because I know how challenging it is and how quickly we want to talk ourselves out of it. And for whatever reason, it's its own artistry that kicks up every insecurity. So I want to say to your students, to the people listening, if I can do this, if I can develop the skill and the self-confidence and push those limiting beliefs and learn how to titrate my nervous system, which is key, and I can talk about that, mm -hmm. then so can you. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. You can do it. You know, you can do it. And that's the one thing that people just don't realize. They just need to get out of their own way. You know, that's really what it comes. Just get out of your own way and just know that you're, you're not doing it. It's not about you. And so many teachers get caught up like they're they're trying to be the teacher that taught them. I, I see that. You see that all the time, you know, because like that's really what you're learning from. So you're trying to be that person. And you can even hear some of the words you're saying are like the same sayings and the catchphrases and, and whatnot. And it's cute. And uh, I, I did it like I was there, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then, you know, when you grow from there and then you you become the person that they're looking to to hold the space for them it's like there's a powerful shift that happens and it, it takes work and showing up to get to get to that point just like you're saying so in yeah. an, an amazing story and, and i love it and i love to piggyback on that story because obviously like you started teaching yoga then you know, you've done a whole bunch of other amazing things along along the path that have gotten you to to your amazing book that just came out that brian went to your book signing and we'll, we'll jam on that in a minute uh yeah <laughs> revolution of the soul and uh but i listened to this podcast that you had and it's about the same kind of thing with the vertigo and the blackout but i listened to when you were on Catherine's show on free cookies and you were public speaking, you know, because obviously you never thought you were going to be a public speaker because you were never going to get in front of more than eight people. So, but then you were, you were on the stage and there was the audience there. So like, let's just take the setting, like you're in the class or you're on the stage and there's a massive audience there and you had the vertigo blackout. Do you remember that story that you told on Free Cookies? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. that, that only but, happened a few years ago. That's yeah, it was just, that was recent. Yeah. That was recent. So <laughs> can, you give, can, you, can you tell that, that story and a little bit about it and how you were able to ground? Because when you're in the moment and you're teaching, like you can't just leave the room and just no. like, like they'll <laughs> figure it out. Like that doesn't work like that, mm -hmm. you know? But you ha like, what are some skills or what did you do in, those, in that sure. moment? to get it together and to deliver, even though you were d uncomfortable with the setting and uncomfortable with what was going on within, can you give us some uh, insight sure. on that? Well, let me backtrack a little bit because sure. and, and, along the way, there are tools for self-regulation because that's key. Um, so after I first became a yoga teacher, I realized that I could teach a class as long as no one looked at me. <laughs> and then I went national. and going national, it was very quickly. It was only two years after I was, um, you know, out of my teacher's training 
And so I, I felt like a fraud a little bit. Like, why the hell am I national? Like, you know, no one knew that I'm incredibly, you know, anxious and, you know, trying. So I was just like, okay, just fake it, just fake it. So what I would do when I would walk into a room is say, hey, everybody, I'm Sean coming to Downward Dog. Ah, so the eyes were off of you. Yes. Got it. And one day I go to Chicago and I get my schedule when I'm there. And it shows that I'm going to be teaching a class. Then I have a one hour master class for teachers, trainees, and it's mm-hmm. a lecture. Then I have to teach. Um, uh, this is at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And I said to the, the host, I said, did I agree to this? Like, <laughs> And he said, oh, it's something that we always do with the master teachers. You guys, you give a talk to the teacher's trainees. And I start to panic inside because I realize I'm going to have to sit within a room with 50 people and just talk. And I actually remember it was between uh, classes and I was going for lunch and I was actually fantasizing about getting hit by a car, (laughs) not bad enough to get hurt, but enough to give me an excuse to not have to go back to class, like a legitimate excuse. Oh my and gosh. again, that was the thought that popped into my head was, how dare you? Like, you've got this incredible opportunity to impact people and you're going to let your insecurity get in the way. So again, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Embarrassment. If you say no, this will go no further. Everything that you do will stop right here. So I had to say yes. I sat in that room, everyone was in a circle, and and I wasn't genius, but I remember sitting there cross-legged with my fingertips on the floor. That was grounding me. And I also realized that what was uncomfortable was when I would make eye contact. And, And now in time, I realized that what the eye contact thing is, I'm an empath, as most yoga teachers are. I pick up energy in my eye. Um, oh, excuse me, in my right eye is kind of the psychic eye. It's where I pick up information. This is why I get dizzy is because too much information mm-hmm. comes through me and I didn't know how to manage that in my body. I didn't know that at the time. So I realized right away that it was making eye contact with that many people that was kind of throwing me off. So I looked over their heads and didn't make any eye contact. I don't know if they noticed or not. And I know it was a little bit weird. <laughs> but I did it and I managed to, it, I wasn't a genius, but I got through that hour. I didn't faint. I didn't die. I didn't black out. And so I made it a commitment that every single time I showed up for class that I would go to the front of the room and take, even if it was just three minutes to introduce myself and explain what the weekend was going, going to be. But I, at first I had to do it just looking over everyone's head. Then I started pulling people up to the front of the room. And I realized that when you're with a group of people, there's always energy that's meeting you with full heart where they, no matter what you say, they're going to just love you. And I would kind of connect with those people and I would make eye contact with them. Everyone else, I would look over their heads until my nervous system got comfortable with that. Then in time, I would pick the five people that I knew were just like rooting for me. (laughs) And then I would pick three that were, whether it was a projection or not, but the ones that were like, you know, I could feel that they were not quite sure, you know, that they were, Mm -hmm. you know, that I had to work a little harder to, to pull them in. And until my nervous system got used to that. And then there were certain things that I had to do physically. Um, I always had to sit. Eventually, I learned how to do it standing. When I would stand, though, I would use my hands um, as a way to self-regulate my nervous system. I would use my hands in these weird patterns that almost made me look like a flight attendant. And so <laughs> directing <I> w- traffic. <laughs> right. So what I would do is I would hold a crystal or a cup of tea in one of my hands. Usually it's a tea mug. And if you look back at pictures of me or videos of me talking publicly, I almost always have a mug of tea in one of my hands. And the reason is, is because of the weight. Mm. It helps me use my hand like this. Then I can switch it. So it looks like I'm more casual. But again, I'm titrating my nervous system. 
But eventually, the cup of tea has to go down. And so over the years, I would just go towards anything that was getting in the way of me being a, a real powerful public speaker. I wouldn't look at it as with self-beat. I'd be like, okay, here's the thing now that you have to start eliminating and look what comes up. Um, and always it's just fear. Mm -hmm. And so years go by. I don't need the crystal. I don't need the, the mug. I know how to, you know, I could talk in high heels. I could wear lipstick. I don't need a <laughs> script. Um, but this is 30 years of practice. Yeah. Cut to. I'm now on stage uh, in front of about 4,000 people. And this is a new level in my career as a public speaker. And I've made the decision. Everyone is scripted on this, uh, at, the, at this event, this tour that we're doing. But I made the decision not to script. That I was going to, again, do what I do, speak extemporaneously, tell stories, um, work off the audience. This was very arrogant of me. I, I skipped a bunch of steps because there were certain things about the experience I wasn't familiar with. One is bright lights being in front of me. I can't see the audience. The other is that there's usually a stage and sometimes a large gap between the stage and the chairs where again, I can't see anybody. So I'm speaking into an abyss. Mm -hmm. um, and I get to this one event. Uh, this was in Denver. And before I had to speak myself, uh, I'm with Glennon Doyle um, and uh, I can't remember, a bunch of uh, uh, Valerie Carr, a bunch of other speakers, and we're all being um, interviewed on stage. And I remember being asked a question. I answer the question. And then I turned to Glennon and I hand her the microphone because it was going to be her time. And when she took the mic from me, there was an odd look on her face. Like she was kind of startled and then just took the mic from me. And I thought to myself, that was weird. And then I realized that I didn't fully answer the question, that they asked me a question. I got maybe halfway through and just stopped talking and Thank handed you. Glennon the mic. And the reason I did that is because I'm sensitive to altitude. Altitude mm. triggers vertigo. I lost my train of thought. In my mind, I was done, but I wasn't even close. Oh. I had jumped thoughts, so I started with a thought and jumped somewhere else and was probably completely incoherent. And I thought, oh my God, oh my God, I'm gonna get vertigo. And I started to get anxious. It's now my turn to take the mic. I've got 12 minutes on this stage. And I, I'm, I'm, I start talking, and for the first 30 seconds, <laughs> it's genius. <laughs> then all of a sudden, I jump from one thought to another, which normally, as an experienced yoga teacher, I can do that because I know how to, I know how to swing back and fill in the gaps. But, when I, but in this environment, the vertigo, I watch myself do that. I try to backtrack, but my brain won't work right. And I feel my heart beating fast. I feel everything going black around me. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have a vertigo attack here. And once I have vertigo, there's nothing I can do except really throw up. That's the yeah. only thing. Surrender. Yeah. Yes. It's, there's no, there's, you can't get out of it once you're in it. Mm. And I'm about to have an episode in front of 4,000 people. And so I, I turn to the, the women behind me that, you know, the other um, speakers and I make some sort of a joke because that's usually what I do when I'm about to have a panic attack. And I, uh, <laughs> same <-sies. laughs> yes. and then I turn back and um, I start again. Same thing happens this time. Now it's getting blacker and blacker and blacker. And I'm a little part of my, in my head, it's saying, you need to explain to this audience that you have to, you can't do this right now, that you have to get off the stage and just apologize. And another part of my, my brain is saying, no, you muscle through this. You got this. You, you are, it's psychosomatic at this point. You're making this happen because you're having an anxiety attack. Mm -hmm. It's really what was happening. I was having a panic attack in front of 4,000 people. And I remember I stop, I take a breath. And I say, um, I want to tell another story. And another part of my brain says, um, good on you. And 
then I say, I believe in God. And the other part of my brain says, where are you going with this? <laughs> and for the next 15 minutes, it was like holding the reins. It's the only way I can describe it. Holding the reins of a wild horse. I didn't move, I stared straight, and I just launched into this story. And I, I tried not to razzle-dazzle. When, when I shifted into the teaching, I just put one piece of the teaching in front of the other, did not jump ahead and try to swing back around, and just breathe. But I knew if I veered off, either physically, emotionally, psychologically, a fraction of an inch, I knew I wouldn't be able to get those reins back. But I also believed that if I could just breathe and stay in my body and hold those reins and keep it simple, then I could get through this experience. And I did. And I would not say it was genius. Um, the next morning I woke up and my whole back felt so bruised because it really felt like I was physically holding like, my, my energetic body on this pathway. And, but it was a fascinating experience because later I thought to myself, again, don't get cocky. I jumped steps. I wasn't ready as a public speaker to do what I did in that scope. Mm -hmm. And there were skills that I, I still needed to develop to build that confidence. And more importantly, there were skills that I already had that I could reach into in that moment that actually worked. And that was very affirming in my soul. Like I thought, all right, if that ever happens again, I know I can get through it. Like yeah. I know that my physical body can do it. And uh, that's what I hope. I mean, my, my experience is kind of extreme. And for all the listeners, titrate, go towards the limiting beliefs, go towards the edges, find the things like the, like the mug, like the crystal. Sometimes I would keep a, um, a vial of salt in my uh, pocket. And when I, was, when I teach, I reach into my pocket and I hold the salt and I download the energy because as yeah. empaths, all I'm doing is taking energy in. Yeah. And yeah. until I was skilled enough to discharge the energy in other ways, I would just psychically hold on to that salt and just dump the energy into that salt and then pour it out later. But for me, what I hope this illustrates is don't give up, find the skills that work for you, keep confronting all the ways in which your mind is going to talk you out or sabotage the experience and remind yourself that you are in service to something bigger than yourself, which is God that all of us are being asked to use our unique voice in a way that is going to uplift, inspire, um, and provide very specific tools to help others on their transformational uh, pathway. And nobody can do it um, in the exact same way that you can do it. Yeah. And that the only thing that's going to block you from your own personal genius is those insecurities that are embodied based on our upbringing and socialization and ancestral trauma. And the work is to go towards those limited beliefs, not away from them. That's what's going to elevate us as teachers and make us more compassionate so that we can be present to the challenges that our students face. Yeah. Lean in. Lean that's, in. That's so inspiring to, to everybody out there listening, especially, you know, Getting up in front of people and speaking, especially as a new yoga teacher, that was terrifying to me when I first, it was so terrifying. I, uh, I think it was like two weeks. I was like, couldn't sleep and just knowing how to get in front and, you know, going through every single possibility of me screwing up up there, you know, everybody's going <laughs> to laugh at me and, you know, yeah, and it it's happen. just, it's so humbling to hear you because you're you're just uh, appear very confident in talking and when i went to your book signing in tempe arizona love the book thank uh, you <laughs> you were very confident up there too and just hearing your story like it, it's not it didn't all start that way and no. it, even even years later getting into a different environment and happens again it's just it's yeah. very very inspiring thank you so much for sharing that sure. Well, yeah. even with the, the book tour, that's a very different experience. You know, um, I had to learn 
Like I don't read well. I, I can, I, I've learned how to, how to speak well, but when I read, I'm flat. I'm really monotone. Like there's no, uh, oh, my dog just fell off his little cushion. <laughs> Come here. Fix the dog. <laughs> Fix the dog. <laughs> if you're not watching on YouTube, go watch on YouTube so you can see the dog. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, there's Charlie. He has a little cushion right next to me and he just literally rolled off of it. I think it the was, dog's been meditating. I think Charlie's been meditating the whole time. Yes. Hi, there you go. There you go. Um, so I actually, I hired like an acting coach before I went out on tour so that I could learn how to read my own book and actually practice. It, it was so vulnerable and emotional reading my book in front of people and talking about my own personal process. And I wanted to be effective at it, but I, I didn't get cocky. I decided to go in and learn how to read and how to share the content that it would be sometimes reading, sometimes extemporaneous. And so even the book tour was for me, I looked at it as one more opportunity to learn how to grow as a speaker and didn't go in there with, um, with cockiness. Uh, everything for me is about how do I get more skilled um, at this so that one day, maybe my next book, I can get on you know, in front of everybody and just read with all that confidence. What's up, yogis? It's Pedro chiming in. Just wanted to give a quick shout out to our two sponsors of the show, and then we'll get right back to this episode with the one and only, the amazing Sean Korn. Shout out to Clever Yoga for sponsoring the show. They have amazing yoga mats, props, accessories, and all things to enhance your yoga practice on and off your mat. The products are designed for yogis by yogis. I have a bunch of the products like I told you in the beginning. Literally, the entire collection is in my house, and I love them. So check them out at cleveryoga.com, and make sure to use code YOGISHOW20 for 20% off your purchase. And that's YOGISHOW20 for 20% off your purchase from cleveryoga.com. Our other sponsor of the show today, again, is Moxie Malas. Amazing mala beads. Absolutely love them. They really are wearable affirmation of the energy within. They're created with genuine stones and crystals with love, handmade in Minnesota. Each piece represents a part of your journey. See what your journey looks like, your Malabi journey, at moxiemalas.com. That's M-O-X-I-E malas.com. Check them out and make sure to use code YOGISHOW15 for 15% off your purchase. I have some of the beads. I actually like to meditate with them. It makes me feel really good. And just like the power and the energy that comes along with it is super, super amazing. So check it out. Thank you so much for checking into the show and tuning in. Now let's get back to this episode with Sean Korn. Yeah, you, your, your talk was great. You um, like I, I'm still like there in some of the stories that you shared, especially when you went to India and you know, you met like Amma, the hugging saint and just all that. Like I, I was there in the story. So like great speaking, like, yeah, I felt like I was in India with you. Thank you. Okay, that makes me happy. Thank you very much. I love that. And it, you know, doing the book, it's like, so you go from yoga teaching, you know, that's what so many people think about. It's like, they see you and they're like, oh, she's like, it's Sean Korn. Of course it's Sean Korn. Like, well, Sean Korn was just like everybody else, like doing a teacher training first. And then, and then I guess four more. So they did five, <laughs> but you know, so not, not everyone did five more, but you know, going through the thing and then, you know, public speaking, teaching around the, you know, around the globe, leading retreats. And then, uh, and then to the book, you know, I, when I listened to something uh, that you said before about, you know, the book was like, you never thought <clears throat> that you would do the book. You know, you never thought that it would happen. Um, and I know Brian's aspiring in his life to write a book and I am too, you know, and it's like, I don't I don't know what the context of it's going to be. I know, I know what Brian's, it's just fucking yoga. That's going to be <laughs> Brian's book. <laughs> and, uh, and it's going to be a bestseller, Brian. I, I, I feel it, man. But you know, the reality is like going from going through the steps and going through the process um, to get to the book, you know, that's like a whole journey in itself. But can you tell us a little bit about the inspo? Like, you know, once you decided to sit down and be like, okay, it's time, like it's time for me to do this. Like this is the next step of my journey. Like what did that look like and how did it go? Uh, it was a nightmare. It was something <laughs> like I was really, that was like the next frontier in terms of developing confidence because I, people have been telling me for years to write a book and I really resisted because it, it's one thing to teach a yoga class, um, especially when you have a certain amount of training. You know, I can grab information really quickly. 
Um, it's a technique that you can throw away. That's the artistry of teaching yoga. You have to have technique though, you know, mm -hmm. before you can actually touch into the art. It's like any kind of art. Um, and, but when you're teaching, I've heard myself contradict myself mm -hmm. while I'm in the middle of teaching. I'll say one thing. And then five minutes later, I just said something else. <laughs> and, but the thing is what are, what people are hearing is the conviction, the, the passion with what I'm saying. They're not often hearing the literal words. They're hearing the energy that's driving it. And so when I hear myself contradict myself and I see that the students are responding the way in which I want them to, I don't bother backtracking. It's not important because I know they got it. Been there. Get it. Yep. But Thank you for sharing that, by the way. That was really that like that meant a lot. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that. sure, sure. <laughs> and but when you write it down, a student can actually look at page 10 and page 100 and be like, <laughs> oh, Sean, there's some incongruency here. Like you've got to own every word. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I also felt that there there was an expectation that the community had of me that they, there's a it's been a long time. I'm now older in the community. I really felt that I couldn't just write any old book, that it had to be honest and vulnerable and raw. And I knew that I was going to be inviting people into a process of transformation. I was going to be encouraging them to confront their limiting beliefs, to reframe their narratives. What I didn't anticipate was that the book was going to demand that I did that first before I could invite others into that process. Mm. And so it was almost instantaneously where I knew I was about to go into a rabbit hole of personal and creative despair and to confront uh, on some deep truths. Now, as a yoga teacher, here's, the sh here's one of the shadows of a yoga teacher is that I can tell you how I feel without actually feeling it. Meaning that I mm -hmm. have... I'm so adept with language and philosophy that I can hide behind my role as a teacher and bypass the actual emotional experience and no one will know. They will think I'm self-aware. They'll think I'm in my vulnerability, but I'm not. I'm in my bypass. Mm -hmm. And the book does not allow that. It was, and it sucked. It was so hard. <laughs> Um, it was actually very traumatic. I was in therapy every single week as I started to peel back some of my own narratives. Um, I knew that I ha it had to be both personal and technical, meaning that the way my book is set up, I tell an, a personal narrative and something within my own spiritual journey. And then the second part of the chapter is me now as a teacher saying, here's what was really happening. Here's, mm -hmm. here's the philosophy. Here are the tools that I couldn't have known at that time but this was what was unfolding. But in the narrative, I can't have that awareness. So I had to write it from the place of 18 or 22, where I'm still in the trauma, where I'm still in the unknown, mm -hmm. the fear, the doubt, the insecurity. And so I had to approach the book from these two different emotional lenses, one from a place of experience and wisdom, and the other from a place of real pure vulnerability. And it was a mind fuck. Oh, and oh shit. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> it was one of the most inspiring things I've ever done. Now that I'm on the other side of it, yeah. while I was in it, I would tell everyone, like I would say to the two of you, like as a friend, yeah. if you said you were writing, going to write a book, I'd say, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. It will suck yeah. the life out of you. That's what we tell everyone that says they want to start a podcast. We're like, don't fucking don't do it. Don't fucking start a podcast. <laughs> don't fucking start Anybody a podcast. Out there. <laughs> Well, that's my advice. But as a sister on the path, yeah. I would say this, do it. Hurt, do it hurt. everything that you have. Face every limiting belief. Just challenge yourself because your life will never be the same. That's right. It answered every single one of my prayers. It healed me in a way that I hadn't expected I even need, needed healing. It matured me. Um, the confidence that I have now as a human being has has elevated to such a degree because of that experience. But I swear that during the process, every day, my mantra, at one point during the day, I would say, I don't know what to do next. Like I literally did not know how to solve a problem. It was usually technical and creative 
um, just how to make something connect, how, how to make the sentence make sense, um, how to do the research, whatever it was. It was like, I don't know how to do this. And yet I figured it out. And proof is because the book got finished. Yeah, but, <laughs> right. And it was no different. It was just on a different level, but no different from my first teacher's training. It's like the same, yeah. I had to go up against those same fears, this. but with a different level of experience and wisdom. So it was intense. It was tough. And there were so many times, like when I got halfway through the book, when I got to the point like around forgiveness, like the, the book is, is, is in two different halves. The first is evolution of the soul. The second is revolution. When I was done with evolution, I was like, I'm done. I'm complete. I knew <laughs> I could hand that book in and people would love it. But I knew it wasn't done. I knew that. And I knew it wasn't what the community expected from me because it didn't do the now what. Like now that we have these skills, what do we do with this in the world? Right. How do we affect change? How do we really step into leadership without creating more harm? And that was the part was like, oh my God, this gets scary. Because I had to then confront my own internalized uh, biases, prejudices, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, et cetera, and connect it to not just personal trauma, but historical, ancestral, um, cultural trauma that lives within my body and the way in which yoga as a, as a skill can help us to excavate it and normalize some of these more challenging conversations. That's when shit got real. Yeah, mm -hmm. no doubt. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, bet it, I bet it made you like, how did it affect your teaching after you finished the book? Like, Ooh, maybe give class. me like three things that really helped after you wrote the book with your teaching. Oh, it, it deepened my, philosophically, um, like it deepened my understanding of some of the nuances of the philosophy of yoga, because during the four years, I had to do a lot of research. Um, and whether it was around the yamas, niyamas, or the, the koshas, kleshas, there was just research I hadn't done since really my first teacher's training that I had just kind of taken for granted. Mm -hmm. And to it, it, in, all, in those four years, I had to do this research, digest it, and then express it through my own languaging. And then I started noticing that that information started to come out in the classes in a very brand new way. Um, it definitely, it, 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 it just made my teaching richer, hmm. um, more nuanced, more creative, more confident. Um, you know, I'm 53 years old. I am no longer an ingenue within this community. My teachers are, are growing older. They're not as accessible and or they're dying. And that means my own role as a mentor inevitably is being elevated. And that's going to require me to be more clear about my messaging. Way more. I've never been apologetic about what it is that I bring out to the, I wouldn't say never, but in the last, you know, 20 years, I'm, I'm pretty fearless in my willingness to talk about issues that a lot of other teachers would shy away from. Mm -hmm. I even feel, I feel even that much more obligated now to, to do that and to model back to the community what it looks like to use your platform in these ways. I also feel more of an obligation to to use that platform in this way so that other young teachers don't take the kind of hit that I might take um, because they can't afford to. Um, mm -hmm. Meaning to talk about politics, to talk about things like justice. Young yoga teachers might be like, I just wanna, I just, I got four classes to fill and my yoga studio won't let that happen. And maybe if someone like me does it, it'll open up those doorways for others to do it with less, mm -hmm. Um, with less harm. And my book gave me that much more freedom to do that. Um, because if you read the book, you know who I am, what I stand for and what my commitments are. So it's no surprise when I show up in a class and I throw some of this messaging down. It's not mm -hmm. like anyone can say, oh, I didn't see that coming. Right. Um, if they didn't see it coming, it's because they didn't see, they didn't do the research. <laughs> yeah. They uh, didn't know who they were getting. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't know the amazingness that. that was coming their way. They didn't understand. <laughs> I, I love that. And 
So I have no hair and I can't really grow hair. How do I like I just have hair jealousy with you? I have hair jealousy with you. Yeah, hair envy. Like how how do how do I get over that? (laughs) Wait a second, it looks like to me you shave that hair off. Yeah, I mean I try and grow it, but it's very thin. Like it's very thin. So I just yeah. I I go better bald. But but I absolutely love your hair. Thank you. You got a good skull though. You got a good skull. (laughs) I can see that. Um my uh, my hair right now it's it's actually still wet so by the soon you know my hair just keeps getting bigger and bigger as the day goes by after i wash it um <laughs> hair tips good i i think it just has to do with lifestyle uh eating well genetics making sure that i'm not putting things into my body that's not mm. nourishing my hair definitely like all of our hair you know it's affected hair and nails by yeah. what it is that we're ingesting but it's also genetic my family the, this hair runs in my family i got good so, locks in your family uh, Sean. but I my dad good. was bald and uh. my dad used to love when i would he would take my hair put it over his head and have us take pictures <laughs> <laughs> see what it looked like to have a full head of That's hair awesome. so, so That's when so I see fun. you in Phoenix, we'll take one of those pictures together. Oh, oh yeah. Awesome. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Then, that, that's, a, that's a great way to get over the hair envy. Just that's so go good. over my head. <laughs> when we had, Sean, when we had, we had Sadie Nardini on the show and we were talking to her, like, we're like the best, uh, you know, best hair game, you know, with the Mohawk. I was like, you're like one A and Sean's like one B or vice versa. And she's like, <laughs> Sean can be number one. Like, I'll take the other. I'll just take the Mohawk. <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> oh, then- I love that Mohawk. I absolutely love it. But there was some, there used to be this thing called Yoga Dog, which was a satirical, a satirical website back in the day, um, a long, long time ago. And this is before it was, um, it, it, it's so common now, but way back then, Yoga Dog was the only one to kind of make, winkingly make fun of yoga teachers. And he did this satirical piece on me that Sean Korn shaves her, shaved her head and what an uproar it was in the community. <laughs> and he, he put a side by side picture of me. He had photoshopped my head bald, and and then the other one regular. And I thought it was hysterical. Oh my gosh, I need to see that. <laughs> but people actually thought that I had done it on purpose. Oh and shit! I, yeah, it was very funny. Yeah, check it out. So. Oh my gosh, that's so see. fun. That's so fun. So Sean, um, I know you're on limited time because you're grandma, and you got to get to the, you know, you got to get to life after this. <laughs> uh, let me get. Let me ask you so before we before we sign up, let's go, just a couple more minutes. What um? So now the the book is done. Um, and you, I've heard you talk about that you're looking to get into more of like getting the teachers on board and like f- helping the teachers find their authentic voice. Yeah. Like what's one thing that you could say that you would say to a teacher that's aspiring right out of training, you know, just having a few classes, like what's something that you could hit them with that would give them that, that courage to really like, like to find that or like, how mm-hmm. would you show it to them? When a teacher first comes out of their teacher's training, unless they're really mature psychologically, mm-hmm. what they should know is that for the first couple of years, they're going to sound like everyone but themselves. And that's part of it, that they're going to sound like their teachers. They're going to be, you know, mimicking. They're going to be memorizing things that they've read elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And just to give themselves a little bit of a break to know that that to find one's voice takes time and practice. But when it is time, the I don't know how to express this because it's, It depends on the teacher because certain teachers are just going to be committed to the technique and that's fine. Just learning how to give the basics. That might be their service to the world. For other teachers, it might be going into the room and putting on music and and creating these ecstatic experiences. That might be their medicine. Although I would challenge them on that as well because sometimes that's also a crutch to actually avoid bringing yourself fully into the Mm -hmm. room. Been there. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, to bring prayer, which is what my strong point in the room to bring prayer into the space and to make a yoga class, a ritual takes a certain amount of organization. Therefore do not throw everything but the kitchen sink into your yoga class. Offer a little intention in the beginning and a little gratitude at the end. Mm. The rest of the time, just straightforward asana, appropriate sequencing, and uh, clear alignment. 
I have taught shitty classes, but have ended it on a good prayer. And I swear to God, no one remembers the other 89 minutes. Nope, they don't. They, re- they remember that prayer. Mm-hmm. And so if a young yoga teacher can remember this, to go into that space and make a commitment just to end it. They don't have to mention the word God. Just like to, an opening prayer is always you want to call something in. For me, it's calling in the God of my own unique understanding, be it your higher power, the creative consciousness, Mother Earth, or the Holy Mother herself. That covers everything. Mm-hmm. Then there's an ask. May this practice be an opportunity for healing, awakening, remembering to occur, body, mind, and spirit. Then there's an offering, meaning may I release my resistance and transform it into surrender. May, and actually may we, always use the we, not the I. Mm -hmm. May we transform our judgment into understanding and compassion. May we shift our fear into faith. And then the last part is, and then what are you going to do with this? Um, And may this practice, uh, or rather, may the energy in in this class be offered outward into our planet as a unified prayer for peace. Mm. that's enough like boom 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 like these are the the spots you set that little intention it's a ritual it it brings it beyond the body and then asana 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 and at the end thank you spirit for these bodies for our Mm. breath may we never take this experience for granted may we live in awe and in wonder for the beauty of it all um Uh, We ask for continued patience, for continued strength, for continued acceptance. And as we heal, as we open our hearts to love, may um, uh, may we be called to serve this world into peace. Something like that. And so to me, that's what shifts the experience into a transformational journey. It just takes a little bit of putting yourself out there and connecting the class to something greater than one's individual body. And that's yeah. grace. Yeah. So that's what I would recommend. I love that. You know, like taking it beyond, you know, beyond the, the fitness, you know, so many people come for like the fitness and the workout, you know, it's like when you offer that to them as the teacher, you offer it to them as like, this is so much more than that. And like, here are a couple bullet points. Why? And here's like something that we have an intention as a community, as one here in this space to create more peace for the planet, peace for ourselves, peace for humanity, all the things. That's when like super transformation happens and community comes. They're going to, they're, everybody's coming to you. Everybody's coming to hang out with you because you're offering something of value for everyone. Mm-hmm. And that's super powerful. Thank and it's so simple too. Beginning, then asana, and then yeah. end. Like it's yeah. very simple. Yeah. yeah. Because I, yeah, I, I've done it before battle. where I throw so much stuff in there and it's like, okay, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> A little bit too much. (laughs) Yeah. Like I've just learned over time. They're not, during that moment in the middle, they're not listening. And Mm. that's the time to get them in their bodies, to move the tension, to get them to breathe. Because they're going to hear everything that I say at the end of the class very differently. Not from here, but from here. Uh And the words that I use, as long as I keep it simple, it's already when they're out of their own way and in that space of surrender, it's truths that they already know. And so I'm not speaking at them, but I'm actually speaking with them. And that's why when people say to me afterwards, it's like they feel like I'm reading their minds. Um, I'm not. It's, it's a matter of reading their bodies and moving into them into that place of surrender and then speaking universal truths. And universal truths are love, compassion, forgiveness, acceptance, they, it's, it's opening people to be the best version of themselves and to see what's possible when we open our hearts to heal. And if a teacher knows that and understands the arc, then they recognize like that the best service they can do during 80% of that class is to just be mindful, organize the class appropriately, keep it clean, help them to get into those uninvestigated parts of their muscles and not download too much information because the student's not going to hear them anyway. Later, that's when the magic starts. I always so, say, for me, the magic always starts after backbends. 
That's mm. when it's like, it's showtime. Yeah. 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 Now I'm going to start. Now the transmission begins. Yeah. Here comes the download, people. Yeah. <laughs> Here comes the tears, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> all the love, you know, all, all the love, love pouring in, all the compassion, all the kindness. Wow. The universal truth. That was a huge takeaway. I love the way that you articulated that. So thank you for sharing that. You're this. very welcome. Yeah. This has been uh, an amazing time connecting with you amongst your busy schedule, your grandmother schedule. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, so thank you so much for, for carving this out for the show and for the listeners. I know there's so much value for them out there um, within this last hour or so of context of conversation. So thank you so much. It's been You're really so pleasure welcome. With you. I think it's an amazing conversation to have. And I really appreciate the <laughs> both of you wanting to normalize some of these challenges yeah. to the to younger yoga teachers and students that are out there and my hope is that they can take all this information have a really good sense of humor about their process yes. and know that whether they have one person in the room or a hundred that i really believe very strongly spirit gives you the amount of students that your nervous system can handle mm. and make sure that you serve 100 percent that whether it's that one or the hundred because you do not know the impact that your words are going to have on their parenting or on their own teaching or the way they're going to show up in the world. And that it's very important that the more that you get uh, grounded in the space, the more um, excited that they're going to be in offering all that they are to that one or that 100 student. But don't go into it thinking that the 100 students means that you're a better teacher than mm -hmm. someone else. It just means your nervous system can hold that energy. That's how I feel about it. I love the way that you I said that. that. I know I've never thought about that. You know, I've never, mm -hmm. I've never thought about. It. I teach these uh, giant, you know, bigger classes, but I've taught one or two or whatever. You know, I remember teaching at a at a battered women's shelter for two ladies, and this one lady had her two kids there. They were probably like three and four years old. We get to Savasana at the end. The mom lays down, whatever. And I'm laying down. These two kids come and lay on my chest. I was cry, oh, crying, crying everywhere. I was yeah. bawling my eyes out. <laughs> I was just like, holy smokes, man! Yeah. Like. This is transformation. Like this is teaching you. It doesn't matter about like you know money, this fame. None of that matters. Like no. this is the moment. This is the moment why I wanted to become a yoga instructor. You yeah. know, it's so that I can help change the world, share the gift of yoga with the world, one person at a time. Yeah. And like literally in this moment, shift is happening right mm -hmm. here, right in front of me, on me. You know. Yep. So, that's that's beautiful. I yeah. will tell you, the fame and the money is the act. It's it's its own yoga. It's a seductive trap that um, for any yoga teacher out there, if it shows up for them in that way, now making a living, like I'm all for, like I, I, I believe that there can be sustainability in teaching yoga. Mm -hmm. But if you're in it for the money or in it for the popularity, um, it, it's going to hold a mirror up to, again, your own insecurity because there'll never be enough money or mm -hmm. fame or you, magazine covers to fill that void. So I, I always have to look at that as, and recognize, don't buy the hype, stay focused on what the messaging is. This is its own trap. This does not define who I am because it, if it was all taken away tomorrow, the question is, would I still get up and teach one person yoga? And the answer, if it's not yes, then don't do this. Right. Oh, that's so powerful. That's, we, so powerful. that's it. That's, that's amazing. Amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yes. Thank you so much, Sean, for all of your time and that last message to hit me right in the heartstrings mm. again. Oh, um, so you're so welcome. So you're much welcome. Ustrasana coming after this. I'm pouring it all out there tonight. <laughs> when I do. Everybody's getting the Ustrasana tonight. <laughs> Tell them I say hi. I will, will do. Will do. All right. Well, I all hope right. I see you somewhere we, along yes, the way. Would love yes. To, yes, absolutely. We'd love to connect in the future. Thank you for your time. Yogi Brian, thank you, brother, for, uh, you know, for being amazing, showing us your bald head and inspiring <laughs> uh, people to, to grow their hair out. Appreciate that. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sean. Amazing book. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much. And uh, appreciate everything you do. I really do. Love wow. you. All right. Love you too. All Until right. next time, friends. Namaste. 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 And there you have it, my friends. Another episode of the Yogi Show podcast in the books with the one and only Sean Korn. We are so grateful for Sean. What an amazing conversation. I know there was many golden nuggets sprinkled throughout. I'm going to be re-listening to this. Um, because I want to soak up the information from Sean again. So I would encourage you to, to, to do the same. And thank you again to our sponsors. Thank you to Moxie Malas for sponsoring the show. 
with their amazing mala beads. Check them out at moxymalas.com and use code YOGISHOW15 for 15% off your purchase. The mala beads are amazing. They're inspiring. You can use them as essential oil diffusers too. How cool is that? I personally have them and I'm telling you right now, game changer. For my practice of meditation and also just to wear around, feeling that casual, spiritual vibe when I'm wearing them. So moxymalas.com, use code YOGISHOW15 for 15% off your purchase. And our other sponsor of the show, once again, Clever Yoga. Thank you so much, Clever Yoga, for supporting me personally in all of the things that I've done in my yoga career in the last few years. So much gratitude for Clever Yoga and the owner herself, Ellie. She's amazing. The products are awesome. Use code YOGISHOW20 for 20% off any Clever Yoga product at cleveryoga.com and use code YOGISHOW20. Thank you for letting us use your music on the show, DJ Taz Rashid. DJ Taz Rashid is amazing. I'm telling y'all, if you're not having him on your playlist, you are missing out. And if you are still listening to this episode right now, if you're still hearing my voice, thank you. We are so grateful for you. And you should come hang out with us in the Yogi Show Podcast Community Facebook page where we're hanging out, jamming on all things yoga, mindfulness, and gratitude, funny lighten up questions, and having a good time. All the links to everything we just discussed and everything to this episode is below. Thank you to Colin. Thank you to Katie. Thank you to Anton. Those are our members of our squad. Everyone that makes this show go. We're so grateful. Brian, hope you're having fun, brother. Whatever you're doing out there in the cosmos, Brian is the man. We're going to have him do the outro next time because he's some funny. he's got some funny stuff to say. So with all that being said, gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. We'll see you on the flip. Namaste.